All right, well, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And wherever you guys are um, is the house of the Lord because the Holy Spirit is inside of the believers. So wherever you are, the Lord is there. Today is going to be our second of our virtual worship services. Um, next week, Lord willing, we'll all be together again in person. So for today, um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. So if you want to get your Bibles ready, you can turn to Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to read the whole chapter, which will be familiar because we read it, parts of it not too long ago, but we're really going to focus on verses 13 through 17. Uh, so Matthew chapter 3, if you got your Bibles ready. And the title of today's message is Spiritual Refreshment. Spiritual Refreshment. Do you ever think about something that is really refreshing? Like, like what is really, really refreshing? I mean, water can be really refreshing if it's cold, right? But what can be really refreshing? Every time I hear of something being refreshing, I automatically think back to when I was a kid. And they would always run those commercials for York peppermint patties, right? And you would always have that person go, when I bite into a York peppermint patty, I feel like, and next thing you know, they're like on skis in, in, the, in the snow, right? I feel like I'm going down a snowy mountain uh, on my skis, you know, because when you buy the peppermint patty, it's, it's refreshing, right? It's total refreshment. So I know for some of the that are a little bit younger than me, then Mentos became the fresh maker. But when I was a little kid, the big one was peppermint patties. But today we're going to be talking about spiritual refreshment, having our souls refreshed. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confess, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water and repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. That moment heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We pray, Lord, that you would bless and be with us. Lord, we have so many things on our prayer requests, and we lift every one of them up to you. Be with us and be with our church. Be with those that give, Lord, that they give with cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things come from you and return to you. And Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so much so that it makes our heart tender to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And fill our minds and our ears with the Holy Spirit that we may learn your word, that we may live your word, and that we may love your word. And we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Now, over the years, I have heard a lot about baptisms. And I've taken part in many baptisms. In fact, I've taken part in three baptisms just for me. Because you see, as a kid, I was born Roman Catholic, and I was baptized when I was just six weeks old. When I turned 30, and I, I came to the Lord on my own, and, 
and I, I felt the faith stirring within me. My wife at that time had never been baptized, and she said she wanted to get baptized. And I asked the pastor at the time, can I get baptized too as a recommitment? So we were baptized in front of the church, and they poured water over our heads. And six years later, yeah, four, five years later, six years later after that, I got my first ministry position after I finished school. And when I got to that church, the pastor asked me if I had ever been baptized. And I said, have I ever? I've been baptized not just once, I've been baptized twice. And he looked at me and said, but were you dunked? And I said, no, I wasn't dunked. He's like, yeah, we gotta baptize you again. So I was baptized three times in order to get it right. As we read about baptism in scripture, we read about John the Baptist, a man who baptized many people during his ministry out in the wilderness in the Jordan River. Now let's recap here for a minute. Let's recap again, who was John the Baptist? Well, as we talked about a few weeks ago, John was a cousin of Jesus. And the Bible tells us that John, like Jesus, was sent by God. John was a different kind of guy. John was a different kind of prophet. He wore camel's hair for clothes, which would be rough and uncomfortable and untidy. And the Bible says that he lived on honey and locusts. He was rough. He was jarring. He was in your face. And he was just as God intended him to be. He was definitely a sort of Elijah, just like we talked about a few weeks ago. His ministry was as rough as his appearance. There he was out in the wilderness, away from the city, away from the comforts of the city, and the people came, and they came in droves to see John. Now understand that every preacher has a favorite message or, or a school of thought or, or a topic of theology that they like to focus on. I mean, there's lots of preachers that love focusing on the end times. They love talking about revelation, the end times, the rapture. For some preachers, that is just their focus. Then there's some preachers who love to specialize on the Old Testament. And they really focus on the Old Testament. They, they go over the feasts and the sacrifices of the law. Um, they focus a lot on the Psalms. There's some preachers who like to focus on worship and worship music and raising hallelujahs and things of that sort. And that's all well and good. But for me, you know that if that has to do with Jesus, it's all my favorite. But if I had to pick one thing, I think it's really focusing on the gospel message and getting that message out. And actually, the more time that goes by, I used to love to argue points of theology. But the more time that goes by, the more in love I seem to become with the good news of Jesus Christ, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And John had a favorite message too. John's message was all about baptism, period, end of discussion. Because for John, baptism was the symbolic representation of those who had admitted that they had let life, that they had not led the life that they should have. That they were genuinely sorry for how they had been living and that they truly wanted to change. They truly wanted to start over. They truly wanted a fresh start. Brothers and sisters, you have heard me say this many, many times. When one truly repents from the heart, repenting of something that they've done wrong, everything changes. Not some things change, everything changes. Because true repentance brings change. And that's basically John's message. John applied that message to their whole way of living, to repent from the life of sin that they were in and to follow Jesus Christ. And John was passionate. John was full of fire and brimstone, shouting and telling people truly how bad they were and telling people how sinful they were. John was intense and John was bold and John was passionate. But John was also sincere. John was a man of integrity, and John was focused. And because of that, the people respected John, and they responded to John. 
And we know this because throngs of people came to the Jordan to admit their evil ways, to say their sorries, and those people felt the relief and the great joy that comes from realizing that they had moved on. Those folks felt forgiveness. And I'm sure that it was this joy that the people were receiving that made John popular. Because the people were certainly not getting that from the scribes and the Pharisees of the Jewish people. The scribes and the Pharisees, whom we know, were more interested in getting the people to apply themselves to the letter of the law rather than the in intent of the law. Because, of course, they were so superior. So they were able to come off as condescending to everybody that was around them. And we see that today too, right? We see that today in some churches. We see some places that say, hey, everybody, tonight to this week, we're all going to fast. This week, we're all going to do this. This week, we're all going to do that. This week, we're all going to do this. Whatever. Their way was to say, this behavior, whatever it is, is okay for me, but it's not okay for thee. Brothers and sisters, we have all heard stuff like that. And where is the joy in that? Where is the relief that comes from Jesus Christ in that? Where is the encouragement when someone is constantly telling you, you cannot do that, or you have to do this, and basically, whatever you're doing is wrong, or at least it's wrong in their eyes. That type of life is brutal. That is not the type of life we are supposed to live. That trying to obey a law that can't be obeyed is impossible. And it becomes hell on earth. But the reality is that many religions work that way. And I'm telling you, I've been there, brothers and sisters. I've been a part of churches and communities where the expectation was that you would be at every single event and every single thing that was going on, and there were events and things going on non-stop. And heaven forbid you needed to miss one, then all of a sudden your spiritual maturity was called into question. Or all of a sudden your salvation was called into question. Your very Christianity was called into question. And that's wrong. That is wrong. And that's what the Pharisees and scribes were doing back then that John was railing against. Brothers and sisters, just like back then, it should be today also. Christianity is completely different from that. In Christianity, when we realize that we've done something wrong, we say, Lord, I'm sorry. I have really messed up. And I've sinned. Please forgive me. And at that point, we are forgiven. And we have the ability to move on in a renewed manner and in a newness of life. Now let me throw up a caution flag at this point. Because this repentance that we're talking about, it has got to be sincere. It's got to be sincere. Because true repentance and forgiveness produce results. False repentance will only lead to destruction. True repentance and forgiveness produces a change in your life. And false repentance only leads to destruction. Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 5, says this, And everyone came to hear him. All the people from Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him. And they confessed their sins and were baptized by him in the Jordan River. You see how that all ends up? The people were being spiritually refreshed by John. They were being fed by John. And that is why they left the comfortable cities to go out into the uncomfortable wilderness to listen to him. When Jesus arrived in verse 13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. So here among the crowd... A 30-year-old Jesus of Nazareth waded into the Jordan River to be baptized. The Bible doesn't say how, but John recognized Jesus straight away. In verse 14, 
It says, but Jared tried to enter, tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. In other words, Jesus went to John to be baptized. John recognized him as the true Messiah and said, no, you are the one. You baptize me. But Jesus said, let it be this way for now because it is God's will. And John agreed, and Jesus was baptized. <clears throat> now I'm sure, now I'm sure that John baptized Jesus the same way he baptized others. And I'm sure that the others who were watching just witnessed yet another person being baptized until, until Jesus came up out of the water and the heavens opened and everyone saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And if that wasn't magnificent enough, a voice is heard booming from heaven. This is my son whom I love, and I am very pleased in him. What that is right there, brothers and sisters, a fancy word that describes that in seminary is a theophany. A theophany is when you see a visible manifestation to humankind of God, which we see there with the dove coming down and hearing God's voice. And there are not many theophanies in the scriptures, so this is a huge event. Now, it's easy to understand why John wanted Jesus to baptize him first. After all, John had been preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins in preparation for Jesus to come. And here was the him that he was waiting for, right in front of his eyes. The spotless Lamb of God. And so the question has to be, why did Jesus come to John in the first place? I think it was the commissioning and the official start of his ministry. But I think there's a few ways to look at why Jesus came to John. Let's return first to the concept of repentance. Repentance, or the Greek word metneo, means to change. It actually means to turn, right, to turn. The prophet Ezekiel explained what God wanted from his people in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6, when he said, Therefore say to the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, Repent! Turn, turn from your idols and renounce your detestable practices. That's what God wants, brothers and sisters. That's it. Turn from what God finds detestable and follow him. And we all know that throughout the Bible, God pleads with his people to turn away from their sins, to turn away from their failures and their mistakes, and to turn to him, trusting in him to save them. Brothers and sisters, that is what repentance means. And John's baptism, just like our Christian baptism, was symbolic of repentance. Was symbolic of recognizing God's higher presence and recognizing that God can and that God will save us. Baptism essentially marks the inflection point in our lives by recognizing that God is the only one that can save us. And although Jesus himself was sinless, his baptism marked that turning point in his life, the start of his ministry, him publicly declaring his mission for God, that God, his true father. Jesus had come to John as a poor carpenter, but he left John starting the ministry of the savior of the world. Jesus' baptism marked the beginning of his public ministry, and Jesus went from a life of poverty and obscurity to being the light of the world, to being the Messiah that everyone needs to follow. Secondly, in baptism, we see Jesus coming down to our level. There is more to the baptism than this because Jesus descended into the water. And by doing that, he was identifying with us. He was empathizing with us. He was coming down to our level. He was becoming one of us and not the Son of God. And I think that's very important because in all the years that I have been preaching, 
And I have said this on many occasions. What I have learned the most is the fact that Jesus was and is human in every way and God in every way. He is human in every way and divine in every way. And the more I study the word, the more fascinated I am by this, and the more I realize that I relate to Jesus because of his humanness. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who lived in the early to mid-1800s, once sought to describe the incarnation of God in Christ. And he used a simple story. And for any of the youth group that's watching, you guys heard this story already because we went over it three weeks ago, the last time we met for youth group. So here's the story from Soren Kierkegaard. A certain king was very rich. His power was known throughout the world, but he was most unhappy, for he desired a wife. Without a queen, the vast palace was empty. One day, while riding through the streets of a small village, he saw a beautiful peasant girl. So lovely was she that the heart of the king was won. He wanted her more than anything he had ever desired. On succeeding days, he would ride by her house on the mere hope of seeing her for a moment in passing. He wondered how he might win her love. He thought, I'll draw up a royal decree and require her to be brought before me to become the queen of my land. But as he considered this, he realized that she was a subject and she would be forced to obey. And in that situation, he could never be certain that he had won her love. Then he said to himself, I shall call on her person. I will dress in my finest royal garb. I will wear my diamond rings, my silver sword, my shiny black boots, and my most colorful tunic. And I will overwhelm her and sweep her off her feet to become my bride. But as he pondered this idea, he knew that he would always wonder whether she married him for the riches and the power he could give her or for love. Then he decided to dress as a peasant. He drove to town and have his carriage let him off. In disguise, he would approach her house. But somehow, the duplicity of this plan did not appeal to him. At last, he knew what he must do. He would shed his royal robes. He would go to the village, and he would actually become one of the peasants. He would work with and suffer with the peasants. He would become a peasant in every way. This is what he did, and he won his bride. That's an illustration of what Jesus did for us. He became human in every way. He gave up all of the riches of heaven to become one of us so that we could become like him. So then Jesus, by his baptism, was identifying himself as one of us, as a sinner, because baptism was for the immoral, the impure, the liars, the adulterers, and the thieves. In other words, baptism was for us. And yet Jesus willingly plunged himself into the water as if to say, I'm just as guilty as them. Please forgive them. He didn't use those words, though. He said in verse 15, let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Brothers and sisters, the love of Jesus for us caused him to descend to our level. He came to the river because we were sinners and was washed clean because we were not clean. He did what was right because we so often do what is wrong. He became like us so that we could become like him. Jesus' ministry began in this river and ended at the cross. And yet... His baptism was, in fact, a foreshadow of his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. Thirdly, brothers and sisters, we're raised with Jesus through baptism. Brothers and sisters, John preached baptism with repentance for the forgiveness of sins, meaning that without it, we're distant from God because God hates any kind of sin. And we are all unclean and we are all guilty. But Jesus changed all that. Jesus added an entirely new level to baptism. As it came to be a living picture of the death 
burial, and resurrection that we experience with Jesus. If you've ever been baptized by me, you know what I say when I, when I take the person in my arms before we go down into the water. As they go down, I say, you are dead in your sin and trespasses, and then arise to a new life in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 3, puts it this way. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. From this we see that just as the waters of baptism provided Jesus with a way to identify with us, they also provide us with a way to identify with him. It is therefore emblematic of us being cleansed from our sin. It is emblematic of us being considered dead to our old way of living. And more importantly, it is emblematic of us being resurrected in Jesus Christ, where our whole perspective for life has changed. Our thinking is renewed, and we live for him, not for ourselves. Brothers and sisters, amen and hallelujah to the fact that we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Paul in Colossians chapter 2 puts it this way. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Baptism then is not an act of faith. Baptism then is an act of faith. An act whereby our lives are changed and we walk with God. And now we are not sanctified overnight. As I've said before, sanctification is a process that takes place gradually from that moment. It will be slow and sometimes it will be painful. But our whole lives and our whole outlook on life will be changed dramatically. Jesus' baptism that we're studying this morning focused on the start of his ministry, which would take him to the cross. And our ministry, as believers in Christ, actually starts at the cross and then takes us through our faith, our repentance, our baptism, and our journey to him. And lastly, we see here that Jesus is the Son of God. As we return to our story, when Jesus was baptized, he then went, rising out of the river, soaking wet. Something miraculous happened. Verse 16 says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. As if there was any doubt before, there is no doubt now who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit descended in the form or shape of a dove. He descended in, the form, in a form visible for everyone to see. Like a dove, the Bible says, it rested on him, or it remained on him, or it alighted on him, expressing both God's love and God's power. And today we are reminded that every follower of Jesus receives the exact same love and power. Now we may find that hard to believe, brothers and sisters, but the Bible tells us that we are given the Holy Spirit of God within us. John the Baptist said in Mark chapter 1, verse 8, I have baptized you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And later on in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, Paul writes, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit is given to those who place their faith in Jesus. Acts chapter 2 puts it this way. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. It is therefore the Holy Spirit who gives us our new identity in Christ so that we may be truly born again, born again spiritually. The physical act of water baptism demonstrates a spiritual bathing, a spiritual refreshing, a regeneration of ourselves by the Holy Spirit. We are spiritually washed by the blood of Jesus. He applied by the Holy, as applied by the Holy Spirit. Water baptism then symbolizes the work of God's Holy Spirit within our hearts. 
Brothers and sisters, we all know how important water is for our bodies. In fact, I talk about my Fitbit all the time. I gotta drink 72 ounces of water every day. As it says, that's how much I need for my body to be healthy. Well, I want you to think about how important is spiritual water, the living water of Jesus for our souls. The Holy Spirit, the living water that Jesus offers does for our souls what H2O does for our bodies. When we are thirsty in our bodies, only water in some form can bring us refreshment. However, when our souls thirst, when we are in pain, when we are in distress, when we feel lost in this world, only the living water of God's Holy Spirit can refresh the soul. Brothers and sisters, we must therefore let the living Christ be our living water for our souls. After all, it is one of the gifts of God, and it is his spirit who refreshes, revitalizes, and revo revives our dry and thirsting souls. Jesus traveled to the riverbank on that day to identify himself with us sinners. However, he made the way for us sinners to identify ourselves with him, growing into his likeness, and become a completely new person. And it all starts by our sincere desire to repent and place our faith in Jesus Christ. As long as we acknowledge from our heart that Jesus is Lord and that we are ashamed of our sinful ways, the Lord will surely hear us. That's all it takes, brothers and sisters. But our lives will never be the same. Amen? Amen. Why don't you bow your heads with me as we pray to close our time together here this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, our Savior, to die on the cross. Lord, you left heaven. Lord, you became nothing so that we could become everything. And Lord, the only way that we can thank you for that is to place our faith in you, to turn from our sins and to follow you truly. Lord Jesus, be with us. And Lord, as we ask for your forgiveness, let us ask sincerely and let us ask truly, knowing that you do not turn away those who turn to you. We love you, Lord. Be with us from this day forward. And we ask for this in your precious and beautiful name. Amen. God bless you all. Praying that you all stay healthy. And Lord willing, we will see each other again next week in person. Stay close to Jesus.